Praise the Lord. I'm sure most of you listening know this parable. But we're going to listen to the explanation before I make a comment. Next scripture, please. Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the wheat in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Praise the Lord. Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field, the disciples asked. And the Lord said in verse 37, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. 38, the field is the world, the total world, encompassing believers and non-believers. The good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. These are those who hear God's word and keep them. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. You see, we already know those who have not believed are in the devil's camp, period. But in this case, I'm believing that these weeds are the sons of the evil one and those who pretended to have heard but have polluted the message. Because I've often wondered why God cannot strike out many of these wicked men and men of the belly who are deceiving so many millions. It occurs to me these are the sons of the evil one. These are the daughters of the evil one. He's not going to remove them. You see, they're using his name because the enemy has planted them as spies, as saboteurs, as those to destroy, if possible, those who have believed. So many of the so-called geos and pastors who preach false gospel are the sons and daughters of evil ones. You better believe it. Go to your closet and pray and God will reveal these things to you. So don't tell me that, oh, I, I know this. Each year in many countries they prophesy. Each year these so-called prophecies are so failed. Sometimes some of them have joined political groups and anointed their presidents. When he fails, they begin to tell you to do something else. And you are telling me that they are children of God. No, they are the children of everyone. Their business is to cause confusion. And they are causing confusion. But God has raised a good seeds and they will stand in the gap. They will continue to shout with their last breath. The evil ones are so many. The weeds are so many. So, they will remain. Because I always wonder how come God can just knock them out. Kick them out. But he realized that no. He will allow them because he wants those his children, want the Holy Spirit, to be discerning and to draw many away from them. Let us now see the characteristics of the good seeds and the bad seeds. Number three. Good seeds are about God's mission. Why weeds love the world? See, that's the distinguishing matter, period. Good seeds are about God's mission. Why weeds love the world? We're going to read so many scriptures. I mean, don't need interpretation. Just listen to them and you determine if you're a good seed or a bad seed, meaning if you're a weed. If you're a weed, you can repent to that and say, Lord, forgive me. I want to be a good seed. It is in your power, in your hands. And if you're an unbeliever, all you have to do is repent and say, Lord, I come to the cross. I accept the finished work of Christ Harvard. And you, God will use you. God will reveal many things to you. He is calling many of us today into this truth. Let me start by saying this. Weeds love the world and the things in the world. See, let us be honest about it. Weeds love merrymaking. They love things in the world. Weeds 
start friends with the world. <laughs> we just love money. <laughs> we just love to be worshipped. Their ego is as high as the mountains. We just are very selfish. That's very self-centered. It is all about them and their achievements. They lack compassion. They don't have empathy for anybody but themselves. Because if you have compassion, you will not be preaching tight in the church and collecting from the poor and enriching your lifestyle. I'm going to say it. Those who preach tight are not children of God. If they don't know the scripture, they should go back to the scripture and study it and read the Bible or they go to a seminary and be taught how these things are interpreted. Scripture, please. First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Praise the Lord. The man or woman that does the will of God will never love the world or anything in the world. He loves God above everything else. Next scripture, please. James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who is cho chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Praise the Lord. Why is he calling them adulterous people? If they had repented, if they had not repented, they would not be adulterous. They're adulterous because they married Christ and then they went back to marry the world. Says, so don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? You cannot choose God and the world at the same time. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Next scripture, please. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Praise the Lord. You cannot serve both God and money. You, there are only two masters in this world. God and mammon. God and Satan. Because God, mammon is under the control of Satan. He's a demon, incidentally. A very wonderful, in terms from the kingdom of the darkness, but from kingdom perspective, the most destructive demon ever raised by Satan. And money is his currency. And so many have run after it. And continue to run after it. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about those who say they're children of God. The wheat love money. The wits in God's church love money. They love it so much they're ready to mutilate every part of scripture to collect more and more because they have no compassion. Remember, I talked to this God. If you have compassion, you speak truth to power. You speak truth to everybody around you. You will speak truth to power. Even if they're killing you, say, this is the truth. You sacrifice for others. Compassion. Next scripture, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 to 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them, and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Praise the Lord. Please, my brothers and sisters, if you find that you have any of the characteristics of the wheat, this is the time the Lord is saying today in verse 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters. So says the Almighty God to you today. Who will you take? May the Lord guide and help you as you make that decision. Scripture, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. 
none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Praise the Lord. The things God has prepared for those who love him. Unbelievable. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, because so long as we're in this body, the human mind can never conceive the things God has prepared for those who love him. No earthly words can ever describe God's glory, which is what we'll inherit as we're in eternal life. We will be there being glorified together with the Lord Jesus Christ. No words can describe eternal life. No human words. So we are going, well, nobody should try. And we will not even try here. In concluding this segment, the point to make is this. All the glamour of the world, all the weight of the world can never compare to eternal life. Never. All the glory of the world, all the things from the day of creation to now, till the time of the end, can never compare to the life of one person, the glory of one person in eternal life. It is impossible. Scripture, please. Psalm 126, verse 6. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Praise the Lord. The time for the good seeds to weep is now. We have to weep as our Lord wept and weeps still. Because in our weeping for the world, not for ourselves, not being sorry for ourselves, no matter our circumstance or situation. But as we weep for our neighbors, as we cry on our knees for nations and countries and tribes and tongues, as we weep for the salvation of so many, praying that God will help, Remember that what is waiting for you and I, those who will remain faithful, is eternal life. That can, nothing on this earth can ever compare with. So here's a question for you and I today. We're going to ask so many questions now. For you and for me. Do you have compassion for your neighbors? Yes. Compassion is not carrying food and giving them, or giving them money. Compassion is traveling on your knees. Cry each day that God will touch them to repent. Because what is ahead? Even if you give them all the worst goods and they fail to inherit eternal life, what is that? Second will be, do your actions and mind reflect one whose hearts are so to promoting the mission of God? Is that the primary reason of our existence when we repented? A mission that cost God his son. Is that our primary focus? Because if it is not, you can't tell me we have compassion. Can we say we have compassion for fallen humanity? If we are busy enjoying with the world. Can we say we have compassion for fallen humanity? When we have great desires for the things in the world. Knowing yet that that world is passing away. Can we say we have compassion for falling humanity when we are afraid of preaching the gospel for fear of being cut off from the company of our neighbors and friends? Can we say we have compassion for falling humanity when we are tribalists and racists? Racists, those who discriminate based on skin tone. Tribe, those who discriminate because you don't speak the same language as they or don't have the same cultural upbringing. Can we say that we have compassion for fallen humanity when we belong to political parties that are platforms that oppose God's mission? If you belong to a political party, whatever crimes they commit, you are part of it. And you're not reflecting God's glory among the people, no matter how much you defend it.
Can we say we have compassion for fallen humanity when we love to eat from their tables? When we desire to attend their merrymaking activities? Can we say we have compassion for fallen humanity when we know that those friends and neighbors who enjoy their companies will end up in the lack of fire if they don't repent? And yet we're eating from their table, enjoying their lodges. Can we say we have compassion for fallen humanity? If we don't tell those people we are whining and dining, those who are our benefactors and friends, we don't tell them because we are afraid they will cut us off. Many want unbelievers to promote them if they are working, or give them contracts if they are in business, or do one favor or the other for them. We want their goods and are afraid that if we told them the good news, they will kick us out or stop being our friends and benefactors. So we keep quiet. What type of heart do we have if we have such mindset? And of course, when our worldly friends and benefactors die, knowing that they have such merry-making time